This is Excel Tutorial 8, Case Problem 1. We begin by opening a file called Metatracks that we'll find in our Excel 8 Case 1 folder, and then we're asked to do a Save As and to save it as Metatracks Controls. You can see from my title bar that I've already done that. The next step is to go to the Documentation Sheet and to enter the date and your name in cells B4 and B5. Move then to the week one sheet. Notice that we have week one, week two, week three, and other than the fact that I've scaled this up for you to see it easier, it has similar information in each sheet. What we want to do is we want to format this data. And we, this is something that we get in every week, so we'd like to have a macro recorded that will do the formatting for us, and then we can just execute the macro each week when we get our data. So I'm going to go ahead and save my file. I always save a file before I create a macro. That way if the macro crashes or have a problem, I can always just close my worksheet without saving and start over without losing my whole worksheet. The name of our macro is going to be Convert Data. Now you'll use your Developer tab to create a macro. If you don't have a Developer tab showing, you'll have to turn that feature on. You do that by going to File, Options, Customize Ribbon. Right here you can see I do have the Developer tab turned on, but if you don't have it, you'll have to click here to put a checkbox and then click OK. Now in the Developer tab, you'll find an area over here to the left where you have Record Macro, Use Relative Reference, Macros, Visual Basic, etc. These are the commands that we'll be using to create this macro. So we're going to go ahead and record a macro. This dialog box asks us, what's the name of the macro? And we're going to call it Convert Data. I'm going to give it a shortcut key of Control D. Now I can't think of another use of Control D, so that's a fairly safe letter, but I wouldn't use something like Control C or Control V or Control S or Control P because those are letters that are used for shortcuts and I wouldn't want to disable them. You can always use Control Shift and a letter to avoid any shortcuts that you have that you don't want to disable. We look here at where we're going to store this macro. Right now we're just going to store it in this workbook, but be aware that we could put it in a new workbook or even in a personal macro workbook which stays with this computer and is always available to anyone. The next thing I want to do is type in a description of what the macro does. So I'll say that this automates the weekly temperature reading report and click OK. When I click OK, the macro is now recording everything that I do. If you look down at your status bar, you'll see that you have a button indicating that you are recording a macro and you can click that button to stop recording. You can also use the stop recording command on, in the code group of the developer tab. Either one of those will work. Okay, starting with 3A, they asked me to format the dates in the date column. And so I'm going to go ahead and click on column A and select the whole column. I'm not concerned about information down below it. And I'll go to the Home tab. I'll expand my number format and choose the date category. This is the category that I want, so I'll click OK. Similarly, we'll go over to column B and we're going to use a 24-hour clock for the time. So I've gone ahead and selected the B to select the entire column. Again, I'll go to my More button, and this time I'll go to the Time category. And this is the time that I want, a 24-hour time. In column D, they ask me to type the heading Celsius, and then to type a formula that will convert the Fahrenheit temperature in column C to Celsius. And they give us a formula to do it, but I'm going to take advantage of another function, a built-in function in Excel, called the convert function. If you type equal, and then type convert, you can see that this converts a number from one measurement system to another, and there are literally dozens of systems that it understands. You can convert from inches to feet, or, or metrics to inches, or whatever. 
And uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit are one of the accepted uh, measurement units that it understands. So the first argument in the convert function is, well, what's the number you want to convert? And it's obviously 60.5, this Fahrenheit, but rather than typing that, I'm just going to click on cell C2 to reference it. And then I type a comma, and then what's showing up is some of the dozens of um, codes that I can use to convert. The code for Fahrenheit is quote, capital F, end quote. And by the way, that does have to be a capital F. So this is the unit we're converting from, comma. Now we need to enter the unit we're converting to. And you can see in our little tooltip, it's trying to help me, Celsius is a capital C. So quote, capital C, end quote, and close off your paren. Now let's press Enter, and that should make the conversion for me. That's good. Um, I notice in the answer key that they only want one decimal place, so I'll go ahead and decrease decimals enough times until I have it at one decimal showing, and then using my fill handle, I can quickly copy this down by double-clicking that fill handle in the corner. So those are the formats that they wanted in terms of the columns, but now we want to bold the column headings. So let's go ahead and select them all and click our bold button. And then they want to resize the columns to fully display Fahrenheit. It's getting cut off a little bit. So we'll just double click between the C and D column. That's an auto fit. So it widens it up just as wide as it needs to be. Letter G says to place the label average in cell A27. So let's scroll down to A27 and type in average. And then I'll press the tab key. We want to type in a formula that will calculate the average Celsius temperature, and they want that formula to go in D27. So I'll say equal average, open paren, I'll highlight the column, and press enter, and so it turns out that 17.1 degrees Celsius is the average for this particular week. It says next in 3H to make F1 the active cell, We'll go up there and click in F1, and then to stop recording the macro. So I'm going to go to the Developer tab and click Stop Recording. So now we have a macro that should carry out all of those steps. Let's see if it will work. I'll go to the Week 2 sheet, and I'm going to just increase the size a little bit so it's easier for you to see. And then we're going to execute or run that macro. If you remember the shortcut, which was Control D, you can just use that, and that will run it. If you don't remember your shortcut, you can click on the Macros button. You can select the macro, and then you can click Run to run it. So let's try it. Wow, that looks good. If we scroll down, you'll see that we have an average for this particular uh, week. That looks fine, and the macro turned itself off. So a good idea now to save, because it took a little bit of work to get where we are. However, when you save a file that contains macros, you have to do something a little different. You have to do a file save as. We're going to go ahead and save it in the current folder. And here you have to choose the down arrow and choose Save as Type Excel Macro Enabled Workbook. This is just a little insurance that if someone were to get this file and open it, that they would be aware that it contained macros. So I'll go ahead and click Save. In Step 5, they ask us to edit the macro so that rather than ending in cell F1, if you remember we did before, that we will be ending in cell A1. To modify that macro, we're going to use the shortcut Alt plus F11. So hold down Alt while you tap F11, and that opens the Visual Basic for Applications editor. This gives us information about our file, and when you have a modules folder, this is what holds your macro. So by clicking that plus, you can expand this folder, and if you double-click Module 1, this is our macro. So all of this coding here is what's causing those things to happen. This is a sub procedure. It begins with the command sub. The name of the macro is convert data. Everything that you see in green is just documentation. All of the commands are in black, and those are the commands that are actually being executed before the procedure stops, or the end sub.
So the very last line was range F1 select. Well, we want to change that to range A1 select. All right, now I'm going to toggle out with that same combination, Alt F11. We're going to run the macro again. I'll just do it with a Control D. And notice that, what, and it, it's hard to tell that it even ran, but it did. And notice how it placed the cursor in cell A1. Let's go over to week three and run it here. Again, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for you to see. And so I'll put my cursor in F1 just to show you. We'll press a Control D. It ran the macro, and it also placed the cursor in cell A1. In step number seven, they tell us to go to the week one worksheet and to place a comment in cell A1. So I'll go up to cell A1, and I'll right click, choose Insert Comment, and then you can type in whatever information that you want. This is going to say, use macro shortcut, Control D to prepare a formatted report. And so if I click away from that cell, we will not see that comment. If I come back to the cell, it pops up so that you can see it. So this is a good way to remind us of what our shortcuts are for our macros. Okay, we're going to save the workbook, and that's it for case one.